Okay, hi everyone. Um, my uh, talk is going to be titled Plumbing in Python Pipelines for Data, for Data Science Applications. And um, I joined Blue Yonder a couple of months ago. And just to give you a little bit of background uh, about what we do, so Blue Yonder is a data science company and we develop predictive applications in particular for retail, so for instance, a large supermarket change. Uh, chains and there we do things like replenishment optimization so that just means um, we try to predict the demand for uh, uh, certain articles and then give uh, suggest suggestions to the supermarket um, regarding the stock so how much they should buy or we do things like price optimization where we try to estimate based on historical data the relationship between sales and prices and based on that try to set optimal prices. And just to give you an idea, so currently we do more than 500 billion automated decisions per month for our customers. So we're dealing with a lot of data in this context. So here are a couple of examples um, what we typically do. So we do machine learning, we do things like data analysis, we do reporting for customers. And um, when we look at these examples, um, they often look quite similar in the sense that um, we have a couple of functions and they get applied one after the other. So basically we have pipelines. So we have the series of processing steps and the output of one function is fed to the next function. So in this simple uh, example, we might get some data at first, do some computation, maybe some machine learning, maybe create a plot uh, and then create a report, for instance, for a customer. So, um, what this talk is going to be about is um, recognizing this fact that um, a lot of our software has the structure of um, basically being pipelines. We created a, a data flow library at Blue Yonder, um, which basically facilitates the process of creating pipelines. So I'm going to talk about that, but um, I'm not only going to talk about that library, but also the principles behind it and how it affected our development, which is perhaps even more important. So um, the talk is going to be structured into three parts. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about pipelines, what you can do with them, how you write them. Then I'm going to uh, go into a little bit of detail about um, the, the implementation and technical details of the library. And in the third part, I'm going to talk about the effects um, this had on our development process. So part one, pipelines. So here's the same example that you saw before, um, where we uh, got some data at first, do some computation, create a plot, um, then create some report in plain Python code. That works fine. And um, again, realizing that this is basically how a lot of our code looks like, it would be nice to make this somehow more explicit. You can obviously do it this way, but it would be nice to actually yeah, abstract away um, what, we, what we really want to do here. And we also want to encourage developers to write code as pipelines. And this is the main motivation for creating this uh, library, which we call YAML. So again, here's the same example. At the top, we have these four function calls. That's fine. And below that, you see how we would write this as a pipeline. So it's basically just a list with a couple of functions in this list. So nothing fancy there. And um, if we now take this list, this pipeline, we can obviously execute it. It's pretty simple. Just execute the first function, take the output, feed it to the next function, and so on, until you get your result. And this is basically what the library does. So we have this function called run pipeline and we put our pipeline into that function and that just means uh, it gets executed. And then we get this uh, flow that you see at the bottom. We get the data, do the computation, create the plot, create the report. Quite simple. So you might ask yourself, what is the advantage of writing pipelines in this way? Because we can obviously do it in plain Python code that I showed you before. So one of the nice things is that we have a clear separation of the declaration and the execution of the pipeline here. And that means that the actual code 
does not really depend on the backend. So we can switch backends really easily. This implementation of this run pipeline function can be whatever you want it to be. And um, I'm going to talk about that later on, how we can switch these different backends. It also encourages a functional style of programming, whether you're a fan of that or not, but there are obvious uh, advantages to that. So for instance, testability. Another nice thing in this representation is that uh, pipelines are just uh, Python lists. So um, we can do all these standard operations on lists, so we can do slicing, concatenation, whatever you want. A nice side effect, which we didn't even really intend uh, when we developed uh, this library in the first place, is that it's really easy then to do parallelization. Because only the backend has to take care of that. And, uh, all these functions that you see at the top, they don't really have to know anything about that. So how do you define pipelines in YAML? I already showed you an example. Here's another example, slightly more complex, a typical use case. So oftentimes uh, we have functions which might take several para parameters, several arguments, and uh, in YAML we expect a function always to take one argument. So what you might want to do is use this partial construct and bind a certain value to a parameter, which you then see there at the bottom. We uh, set some parameter on this compute function in this case. So again, we don't need anything special from our library here. This is just standard uh, Python code. So it gets a little more interesting once we do something like splitting up data. So um, we have this concept called a splitter in YAML, which basically means we have a generator in Python. So you see this function get chunks, and this gets us several chunks of data, it yields them, and we also have to tell YAML that this is in fact a splitter. So you see in this pipeline definition, we annotate the function with this splitter, so YAML knows that this uh, yeah, does something special in the pipeline. And what you end up with is this uh, thing at the bottom. Now. Um, these things, these different chunks, basically can get processed in parallel, but the same functions get applied to each chunk. Um, we can not only split data, we can also reduce it, so that makes it possible to write something like split map reduce. Um, so in this case, um, we might not want to create a report for each, for each chunk, but instead might want to create a single report where we join these different data paths again, and this is done with uh, what is called in YAML a reducer. So re a reducer in this case is just a function which you see there at the top, this create report function, which just, uh, basically just expects a list uh, of the outputs of uh, the functions that were uh, running before. And uh, we also have to annotate it again, so we have this uh, reducer Oh, I shouldn't do that, I guess. Where is it gone? It's gone. Never mind. Sorry about that. So, yeah, as I was saying, we have to annotate this function again, tell Yamal that this is a reducer in this, uh, in this case, and that means it knows that it has to take these different paths and join it there. Um, Another useful thing um, which we can do with this kind of thing is we can fork uh, data paths. So at some point in the pipeline, we might want to uh, take a piece of data and uh, push it to different functions. So we take the same data uh, in both paths here, and uh, we uh, use this fork. Uh, 
and then we can uh, push the same data to this uh, function create plot, which we had before, and then another function called create plot2, so we get another plot, and um, yeah, all these again are joined in the end and we create a single report. So you see there in the pipeline definition in the third line of the definition, we have this fork construct, which basically means take the data that we have there and push it to these different functions which we, which we have there. Um, if we have these reducers, another uh, essential thing you need is uh, something like scopes. Because before we had this uh, single reducer and it just took all the data and uh, put it into a single report, that's not what you always want to do. So in this case, you might want to create a separate report for each chunk and uh, you want to tell uh, exactly how much uh, this particular reducer um, should join. And that means we have to put it into a scope. So uh, this uh, fork statement and the reducer get this uh, scope and um, that tells Yamal to only join these uh, two uh, data paths uh, for each chunk. That basically means we can nest pipelines very easily. Okay, so um, another very useful uh, construct uh, in YAML are labels and the control flow we can define in terms of these labels. So what we can do is uh, we can assign labels to data. So um, there we have this function uh, labeled data and we, not, uh, we do not just yield the data itself in this case, but also a label. So we get this tuple and we also tell YAML in this case that um, this is a special thing, that this is a label by uh, putting this returns label around the whole thing. So uh, if, you s if you look at this thing at the bottom, um, Yamaha now knows uh, that the first chunk is called uh, A and the second chunk is called B. And uh, what you now can do is something like a, a switch case where we can match based on the labels and then execute different functions. Because in this case, um, chunk A perhaps should be processed by function compute but chunk B uh, should be processed by a different function called compute2 in this case. And this is what you can do. If you look at this uh, case statement, we have to call it when because we couldn't use if. Uh, we match based on the labels and then we execute uh, whatever we have there in this uh, pipeline statement. So this is quite useful in practice actually. Um, and it is very useful because the functions themselves do not, need to, do not need to be aware of this. So obviously we could have a compute function containing some if statement and then do the control flow there. But what we want to do is uh, take existing functions that are maybe part of some library that know nothing about this control flow and we still want to be able to plug them into pipelines without writing some wrapper function around it. So we can do uh, the entire control flow at the pipeline level here. Another important thing is that um, which function is called uh, with uh, which piece of data is actually determined dynamically. So we cannot, uh, before executing the pipeline, we do not know the entire execution graph, but this is basically done dynamically in the splitter, which uh, determines uh, what data gets what label. So a typical pipeline function just looks like this. You have a single argument, um, you do some computation, and um, you get some output. Unless it's the first uh, element in the pipeline, we always expect a single argument. The first function is also allowed to not take any arguments. And uh, typically, these functions are pure. So there are no side effects, which is obviously good for things like testability. Um, and there is no dependency on Yamal. So uh, the entire dependency on YAML is at the declaration of the pipeline. So these functions themselves know nothing about, uh, about the library here. So what did we gain by this? Well, we gained a, a very high degree of reusability of these functions because these functions are very general and um, this is not necessarily enforced by YAML, but it's the result of uh, writing in this uh, writing code in this pipeline style. So it's rather induced by this 
by these design conventions. Um, as I mentioned before, we can have different execution backends, which is very nice, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. And what is also nice is that all the building blocks, so the functions and the control flow, are directly visible at the level where you declare your pipeline. So a person looking at this declaration of a pipeline immediately can see what is going on and what is involved there. It's actually quite easy to read these pipeline declara declarations. Okay, so part two, I'm going to talk a little bit about the technical details of the implementation. So how does Yamal work internally? Well, as I said before, pipelines are just lists of, of uh, Python functions. Um, what we do is uh, we uh, pickle the functions and also all the data. We do this using dill because it's more powerful than, than cpickle. And um, we schedule a job uh, using async IO, or in this case, rather Trollius, because we're still using Python uh, 2.7. But this is basically what happens. So all the things uh, get serialized, and um, yeah, we have this async IO mechanism for scheduling jobs. Um, and a very nice tool uh, which we have in Yamal are pipeline observers. So these are just objects that monitor the execution of a pipeline and get informed whenever something happens in the pipeline, which is very useful for things like debugging or, or to doing performance optimizations. So um, you define your uh, pipeline observer there, this object, and then you pass it just uh, to a list of observers, which get passed to this uh, run pipeline function, and then each observer gets informed whenever a function is called, for instance. So uh, one of the observers uh, you already saw is this graph observer. So all these uh, images that uh, I showed you before, these visualizations of the pipeline, this is basically happening automatically if you use this graph observer. It just uh, yeah, basically generates a graph, a graph with a dot file and uh, you can render that. And then you have a nice visual representation of the pipeline. Another very useful thing is uh, what we call a performance observer, which basically just uh, gathers timing information, which is very useful for yeah, investigating uh, which functions take how much time and where you can do optimizations. So in this case, we have uh, a splitter where we have uh, eight chunks of data. And for each chunk, we have this uh, compute function, which in this case just sleeps for one second. And um, what you see here at the bottom is this uh, dark blue uh, row that's just the uh, execution time of the entire pipeline, so a little more than four seconds. Then you have this red thing uh, in the beginning, which is happening on worker zero. So in this case, we're using uh, two workers, which you can see there uh, with this run pipeline, we use this uh, executor, which, uh, tells, uh, which tells us that we're using uh, Two, two workers in this case, and after this uh, splitter, um, we have our different computations, and they're nicely uh, scheduled on the two workers. So this uh, brings me to the different execution backends. So currently in Yamal, we have uh, three execution backends. We have one very simple for local sequential execution. We have one for parallel execution, um, using subprocesses, and we have one for remote parallel execution where we use uh, an internally developed uh, cluster backend. So these are the three we have currently. However, it's uh, actually quite easy to write these uh, different backends. So anything that uh, can schedule jobs asynchronously could be used here. So things like Spark or Distributed are things we have thought about and it should actually be possible and not that difficult to uh, write backends for Yamal based on these frameworks. So here is an example of, a, of the sequential executor. It's exactly what you would expect. So you have a single worker and all the uh, functions get scheduled one after the other. Um, and here is another example, again using the subprocess executor. So we're still on a single machine here, where we use three workers, 
and again you can see how these jobs uh, get distributed to the different workers. I don't have an image for it, but we can do the same thing on a cluster basically here by just specifying a different executor in this case. So another thing we do in Yamal are performance optimizations where whenever we have a linear pipeline seg uh, segments, so at the top you can see there we have first is call to compute and then we have create plot and this is entirely linear so we can just merge them to basically have a single function which gets executed on a single worker. And um, this is exactly what happens in Yamal. We fuse these linear segments, which uh, in this uh, case that I showed you before is also the reason why you see, don't see any overhead here. So there's no uh, idling time because nothing needs to get serialized because all of these functions can get executed one after the other as basically a single function. So uh, another thing is where we uh, do another uh, kind of optimization. Um, when we have a lot of different chunks, we uh, have the ability to group them by specifying a block size where we have a splitter. So in this case, we have these six different chunks and uh, we can block them. So we have uh, three chunks in a block and then these get, get passed to a worker, which basic basically means we can uh, reduce the overhead um, resulting from the scheduling. Um, another nice thing, um, which might not sound like much, but it's quite useful in practice, we have a couple of debugging helpers, so we have the ability to automatically enter a debugger uh, when an exception is encountered, and we also have uh, an IPython uh, embed that's aware of multiprocessing, so if you have a a sub-process executor that runs in different processes and uh, you run into an embed there, um, it actually acts as a synchronization point. So that means you can uh, just step through the different processes one after the other and not uh, jump into these embeds all, of this, uh, all at the same time, which obviously wouldn't work. So this brings me to the last part. Um, what kind of effects did um, introducing this library have on our development process. So um, this is how a typical project structure currently looks like. So at the bottom we have our usual Python functions, whatever they might use, NumPy, Matplotlib, whatever. Then at this intermediate level we have uh, YAML pipelines and then at the top level we use uh, currently Airflow to schedule tasks. But the important thing is that um, in between we have this have these pipelines, which basically contains yeah, most of the logic. So when we use pipelines and projects, um, one of the motivations for that was actually that projects tend to be um, rather different because customers have different needs. Uh, specific wishes, so it's not really possible to write a monolithic application because you would have so many configuration options that wouldn't really work well. So what we decided to do is we have these rather general functions in a core library um, and within each project we then write our pipelines um, where we can dynamically plug these different things together, in particular stuff like I.O. and the specific control flow, that typically uh, is, uh, yeah, is done on the project level and not so much on a general library level. Um, again, these pipelines provide a very nice view on what is actually going on. So if a project manager looks at a pipeline, he can usually tell uh, quite quickly what is going on there. Uh, and another point is that we're not limited to numerical problems here. So YAML is completely data agnostic. We can pass around NumPy errors, whatever, but it can also be plots, can be arb arbitrary uh, Python structures. So it would be, for instance, possible to combine this with tools like Dask, which is more uh, geared towards uh, numerical computations. You might use that within a specific function, but um, in general, at the pipeline level, you do not have this restriction regarding the data structure. So how did 
all of this affect our development. So we basically have a very strong incentive for, more, for a more functional style of programming. And that is because developers basically get certain nice things for free. So um, they get concurrency basically for free and they also get these other nice tools like these pipeline observers for free. Um, which is actually a rather strong incentive for, for using this library. Overall, we have a much cleaner architecture actually. Because um, writing code in this uh, pipeline way actually discourages you from writing weird spaghetti code and depending on global state. So um, overall, the code looks, looks much cleaner. Also, the data dependencies become very explicit in this pipeline definition. You can immediately see at a certain point what this function should get because you can see all the functions uh, that ran before it. So overall, it's, it's quite easy to understand looking at these pipeline definitions. Another thing is, I already said that we have better reusability and we also have better testability. So uh, regarding testability, um, we basically can distinguish between these three levels. So obviously we have unit tests for individual functions. If there are few functions, that works very well to test them. And then what we uh, oftentimes do is define this kind of uh, pure, uh, pure pipeline, which only contains pure functions, and then uh, have another level where we have the full pipeline, which then actually contains the I.O., so getting the data from some database or writing out some report, for instance. So and what's good about that is that we can uh, quite easily test uh, one and two, and that already covers a lot. So. Um, this uh, third kind of test where we have to test I.O. can actually be reduced to a minimum. Okay, so to summarize, what did we achieve uh, by introducing this library? So we have this clear separation of the declaration and the execution, and as a result we can easily use different backends for the execution. We have a more functional style of programming with all of the advantages that come with that. Um, the functions themselves do not depend on YAML. So overall, the dependency on YAML is quite, yeah, quite narrow because um, it's only happening uh, where you declare your pipeline, which is usually not a lot of code. So that's maybe like 10 or 20 lines of codes usually. Um, as I said before, it's completely data agnostic, so we're not limited to numerical problems here. And other scheduling libraries could just as well be used as a backend. Okay, to give you a brief outlook, um, what we're currently working on, where we actually have a first prototype working, is something like uh, explicitly annotating IO, IO operations in the pipeline. So that means we would make um, side effects uh, explicit at the pipeline level, which is also nice just basically for having an additional documentation where you can immediately see what uh, functions might be doing there, whether they are safe or whether they might have weird side effects. Um, tools for uh, debugging distributed systems, that's another issue. So it would be very nice if you, for instance, have a failing function uh, on a remote system to be able to um, basically re-execute the same function with the same data locally and then uh, can determine what is going wrong there. And another uh, thing finally is uh, optimizations um, which you can do at the pipeline level. So for instance we could do caching in particular if we have uh, things like explicit I.O. annotations that would make things like caching a lot easier. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so it's not uh, currently open source, but let me add two things to that. So um, we're probably going to open source it. We haven't done it yet. Um, the other thing is um, it's not really so much about the implementation here. 
which is obviously useful, but it's really not that complex, the implementation. What is really useful, what I try to uh, convey is the concepts behind it. So writing in this declarative style, separating the declaration of the execution, this is something where we found out that this is extremely useful. So one of the main motivations for me standing here is basically telling you about that and not so much about the specific library. Um, okay, so let me just uh, repeat that question. So the question was whether we have looked into other tools. Oh, ah, okay. Um, so literal tools with a Z at the end. Um, so in general, we have looked at different tools and uh, at the point where we uh, developed Yamaha, so I should add, I, wouldn't, I wasn't there when Yamaha was being developed. I only recently joined the company. So... Um, but yeah, the, the people who originally developed definitely looked at other tools and at that point there was really nothing else there that quite did what we wanted to do there. <coughs> In particular, one of the main motivations was the, was the stuff about uh, being able to assign labels and to do the control flow at the pipeline level. That was something we didn't really see anywhere else. Um, regarding your specific question, uh, tools, again, I'm not really an expert there, so I'm not quite sure, but I don't think um, that in particular stuff like this labeling you can easily do. You Perhaps you could do it, but it's not really made for that. So I guess that would be my answer. What do you mean by that? You mean scaling out uh, in terms of uh, going uh, into a cluster direction? Or? I mean, there are two things to that. So we have the, uh, the okay, I should uh, again repeat the question, sorry. Um, so the question, if I understood it correctly, was uh, whether you can automatically uh, scale Yamal to, for instance, use a, a cluster solution. So um, there are two things to Yamal. So you have the core library with its definitions of splitters, reducers, and so on. So, uh, and then you have uh, these backends. And I guess your question regarding this uh, scaling, that would be something that pertains to the back end. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, now I get the question. So um, the question is basically whether it's possible to automatically, for instance, determine how many chunks you have and, okay. Yeah. Um, so this is something that's not possible currently and I'm not quite sure that we're going to go into that direction because um, in most use cases um, we want the developer to have the control um, to actually decide how many chunks there are, what is being split up there. So if we only had things like pandas data frames for instance, 
it would be possible to do this possibly automatically. But since we're completely data agnostic, we're dealing with arbitrary Python objects here, it's really difficult to put that uh, logic into the library itself. So that's basically why we delegate that decision to the developer. So, um, again, I should uh, repeat the question. So the question was regarding this use of Dask uh, within a function. And um, we haven't really done it. Um, one of the people uh, working on the library played around a little bit with this. And the idea, as far as I understood it, <laughs> um, was basically you have this uh, graph that you uh, get out of Dask. And Perhaps it would be possible to uh, use this graph and just let it execute within Yamal, for instance. That would be the basic idea. Sure, yeah. <laughs> 